Hello, this is your host, Jennifer Baker, and welcome to the Human Brain Project podcast, where we talk to the scientists and researchers that have dedicated their lives to solving the mysteries of the human brain. We discover the humans behind the science and find out how tomorrow's discoveries will be shaped. Professor Steve Ferber is a research explorer at the University of Manchester. He has a long career as a computer scientist, mathematician and hardware engineer. We'll be talking about how these disciplines can help understanding of the human brain. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with a bit of scene setting. Let's lay out the landscape for our audience about what work you're actually doing at the moment. My group at Manchester is primarily involvement with the Human Brain Project is in the neuromorphic computing area, where we are responsible for Spinnaker, which is one of the two large scale neuromorphic computing platforms made openly available to the European community and beyond under the auspices of the Human Brain Project. Now, Spinnaker is um, possibly not very well known to the the lay audience, but it's a a sort of a supercomputer. Am I right? Is it related in any way to quantum computing? Is there anything that would help our audience understand exactly what it does? In many ways, it is similar to a supercomputer. Um, It has no relationship at all with quantum computing. So the Spinnaker machine that we offer the service on at Manchester has a million processors. Um, These are quite small processors. So unlike a supercomputer, which would tend to have uh, very powerful number crunching processors, uh, Spinnaker has small embedded processors, more like the kind of processors you find in your mobile phone. And then these are connected through a bespoke interconnect fabric, which allows them to achieve the very high degree of connectivity found between neurons in the brain. On Spinnaker, each of those million processors can support models of a few hundred neurons and they operate in biological real time. So the model on Spinnaker usually runs at about the same speed as the biological system that is modeling. So it's almost like you're creating a sort of digital twin of the brain that allows you to make all these experiments and examinations. Yes, in some ways it it is like that. Of course, the models that we run on Spinnaker are relatively simplified compared with the biology. A biological neuron is a very complex cell, which to model in detail takes a formidable amount of compute power. What we do is build on the work that's been done by generations of computational neuroscientists in defining simplified abstractions of biological neurons that aim to capture the functionality of the neuron as an information processing element, uh, whilst ignoring uh, most of the detail of the cellular uh, biology of the neuron. And so what are the advantages of this compared to maybe other methods of researching and what has been the impact or involvement with the Human Brain Project in terms of your work? The advantages are that Spinnaker allows the user to build uh, very large scale uh, models of brain subsystems that still execute a reasonably high level of performance comparable with the biology itself. And this has been used in the Human Brain Project to build models of various brain subregions, such as the cortical microcircuit and the cerebellum, basal ganglia, and so on. Now, I should point out that even with a million processors, we don't get anywhere near the scale of the full human brain. Optimistically, we can model approaching perhaps 1% of the human brain or maybe 0.1%. So we're not here claiming that we can run full human brain models. Perhaps a full mouse brain would be within our scope. But it's still useful for research purposes. Yes, it enables users to explore hypotheses and theories about how the brain might work. Because, of course, the way the brain works as an information processor is still a mystery to science. And it's one of the grand challenges of uh, of neuroscience to try and begin to produce compelling explanations of how the brain does its job. But until such explanations are available, science progresses by people putting forward theories and testing those theories. and, And a computer model is a good way to test a theory. Well, I know your background has been in computing for for many years and you've worked on various other projects. Give us a sort of potted history of your career to date and tell us how you wound up where you are now. I guess starting with my university education, I I read maths at Cambridge in the early 1970s and uh, went on to do a PhD in aerodynamics. Um, where the focus was on the operation of compressors in jet engines and uh, taking inspiration from a particularly unusual biological observation uh, to see if we could uh, make some changes to compressor design that would improve them. But in, in the course of my PhD and the subsequent research fellowship, 
I, I started using computers for logging data in my experiments and I got drawn into the Cambridge University Processor Group, which was a student society of people who liked building computers for fun. So I started building my own computers and indeed my PhD thesis was written on a computer that I built myself. And as a result of that, um, I got drawn into the embryonic ACORN computers at the very beginning of home computing in the UK. And when my research fellowship came to an end, I joined ACORN. We're now at 1981. And at ACORN, I was involved in the design of the BBC Micro and I led the design of the ARM microprocessor, uh, both of which were considerable commercial successes for ACORN and in ARM's case, beyond that, for the company that bore its name. So I spent the 80s at ACORN involved in the design of, of, of computers. At the end of the 80s, I decided to return to academia and spent the 90s looking at conventional computing. But by the end of the 90s, I was beginning to get frustrated that although computers had progressed by maybe a factor of a thousand in my time, they still couldn't do things that humans found straightforward. So uh, that's when my interest turned to the brain. And uh, around the turn of the century, I started to think about how one might use computers to accelerate our understanding of the brain. And, and that led to the Spinnaker project, uh, most of which was designed and, and was, was functioning before the Human Brain Project started. So the Human Brain Project has enabled us to turn that machine into an open service and also to develop a second generation of it. Well, I mean, you started out in, in part of the early part of your career as, as a very much a pioneering force. I mean, do you see the sort of work that's being done in the Human Brain Project as pioneering? Or is this new way of thinking about computers in relation to the human brain a new idea? Or are we building on something that has been there for a while? It's not a new idea. The, the origins of neuromorphic computing can be traced back to work carried out by Carver Mead at Caltech in the 1980s when he and his students developed a, a number of models of synaptic and, and neural processes and neural sensors. And, and Mead observed that the equations that describe the flow of ions in ion channels in neurons and the equations that describe the flow of, of electrons in, in transistors in a particular region of operation are effectively the same. And so electronic circuits can be used to model some functions of neurons. And that was the foundations of neuromorphic computing. The, so, so we came in um, 10, 15 years after that. But within the Human Brain Project, there are two neuromorphic platforms. Spinnaker is digital. It's a many core system. It runs simulations in software of neurons. Alongside that, there is the brain scale system developed by the University of Heidelberg which in many ways is closer to Carver Mead's original concept of using analog electronic circuits to emulate the brain rather than simulating it. Those circuits were actually emulating uh, neural functions. And those two neuromorphic platforms are, are highly complementary and, and quite different in their strengths and weaknesses. So the Human Brain Project is, is, is very rich in neuromorphic resources. And of course, what's of interest is in, in the 20 years we've been developing Spinnaker and Heidelberg has been developing brain scales, there's been this huge transformation of the world of artificial intelligence with neural networks coming to the fore over that period. And now there's a strong sense that, that neuromorphics is, is positioned to merge with mainstream AI and provide potential solutions to the huge energy requirements of, of standard AI solutions. So that in the future, we're probably going to see um, far more neuromorphics in engineering applications, particularly where energy efficiency is a major criterion for the choice of, of architecture and design. Well, I'm interested to know how important collaboration is for your work. I mean, and also not just collaboration with people working on similar or parallel sorts of projects, but, you know, cross-disciplinary collaboration and whether that, you think, creates a more fruitful work environment or a more fruitful project outcome and, and how that impacts you day to day. Yes, the Human Brain Project, of course, has put us in a very broad community spreading from sort of electronic engineers at our level at one end, right through computational neuroscientists to lab neuroscientists and indeed the medical neuroscientists. So having built a machine to contribute to research into, into brain science, it's been extremely useful to have access to people working in that area in the Human Brain Project. 
and the various brain region models that I described earlier are all the results of collaborations within the HPP with computational and wet neuroscientists and of course theoretical neuroscientists or the people who generate the hypotheses that Spinnaker is well placed to test to see if their theories of brain function can be borne out by models running uh, suitable algorithms on Spinnaker. So it's been both very well timed and extremely useful to our work to form these collaborations with groups across the Human Brain Project uh, over the 10 years that that project has been running. Well, in these series of podcasts, because we're talking about the brain and often straying into things like AI, a question often comes up, but we almost end up getting into some philosophical discussions about the nature of ethics in this part of work. Is it something that you think about regularly? We have ethical oversight within the Human Brain Project. So there is an ethics uh, a group that uh, comes around and advises and asks questions. I would say that at present, ethical issues do not loom particularly large in neuromorphic technology. And, and many of the ethical issues that arise in neuromorphics are the same ones that arise in, in mainstream AI. Now, of course, there are significant ethical issues in mainstream AI applications some to do with the fact that uh, that large AI networks require very large data sets for training, and those very large data sets are rarely free from bias. So the AI systems that are developed using those data sets for training end up displaying the, the kind of biases inherent in their training data. Neuromorphics potentially has the same issues, although we're typically not working at those scales yet. And of course, we're as I said earlier, we're nowhere near being able to produce a whole human brain model and you know, reproduce a human brain in, in a computer. Uh, if we could do that, then of course we'd be running into some very significant ethical questions. But as things stand at present, the primary ethical issue around neuromorphics is, is the issue of dual use. The fact that any computing device which has reasonably broad applicability can be used for a range of uses spreading from civilian through into military. So those kind of questions do get raised and and, and have to be thought about. Well, I'm interested to know what you would predict if you had a crystal ball and looking into the future. I mean, you were saying that obviously we're a long way from being able to completely uh, recreate a human brain in a machine. But what sort of timescale or what sort of big breakthroughs do you think people should look out for? What might be, you know, a big turning point or a big success point? On the brain science front, We are within striking distance of being able to model um, the complete brains of, for example, insects or rodents and be able to generate a model, for example, of a mouse brain that ran in real time would allow a whole whole lot of, of science to be carried out. Now, we don't have all the data that is required to build a complete mouse brain model at the moment. Um, There are attempts to do that, um, but they involve quite a lot of guesswork for filling in the gaps. Uh, But that's an interesting area. And uh, building a model of a mouse brain that can be demonstrated or coupled into, for example, the robot mouse skeleton, which also has been constructed within the HPP, and seeing if what results behaves or moves like a mouse, that that would be a, a potentially very significant breakthrough. Um, even reproducing insect behavior at the simulation level would be uh, an exciting step forward. It could be Um, fascinating that insects do things in ways that are very organized and if they could be replicated, could be useful, no? Yes, I mean, they're they're formidable. When you look at the the capabilities of the common house fly, which can fly along uh, towards the ceiling of the room and land upside down on the ceiling, that's, that's quite an engineering feat that certainly we don't know how to reproduce in our engineered flying artifacts at the moment. And, and all of that is controlled by a brain which by human standards is extremely small and simple. The fruit fly brain is the order of 100,000 neurons, whereas the human brain is the order of 100 billion neurons. So there's a factor of a million uh, between those two, if I got my arithmetic right. So even understanding an insect brain, um, and being able to model that, reproduce insect behavior would be extremely exciting. Well, um, you mentioned earlier that you had an interest in aeronautics. How did that translate? Is there any you know, similar traits in your personality or your inquisitiveness that you think have sort of maybe a common thread throughout the different areas of work that you've had over your career? I don't know. There was a, there was a fairly logical progression from my 
PhD interest in aerodynamics. Um, I've always had an interest in flying, and in fact, I spent one year of my undergraduate career as a member of the Cambridge University Gliding Club, which involved a lot of standing around at Duxford Airfield and very little flying, but uh, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and, but I began to think that actually building some kind of simulated flying machine might be more productive, and that really is what led to my interest in the University Computer Group, um, the Processor Society, because obviously if you want to build a simulator, then, then building computers is, is, is part of the issue there. And of course, that really came full circle during my early time at Acorn when Aviator was produced with the BBC Micro, which was a beautiful simulation with 3D wireframe graphics of a Spitfire take off and fly around and do loops and fly inverted under a bridge and so on. So although I didn't do the flight simulation side of it, uh, I contributed to the computer that supported that. Yeah, well, well, you know, I was just thinking, uh, flight simulator, it's very Leonardo da Vinci, isn't it? It's <laughs> this kind of ideas that you, you're coming up with and what might work and projecting them into ways of, of modelling them. Yes, but I, but I found through my uh, connections with the processor group and my attempts to build my own computers that, uh, that I, I had an affinity for computer technology as it was then that uh, lots of the things you have to understand to build computers were things which with my mathematical background came very naturally. And, and the explosion in the home computer industry in the early 80s was, was a, a real sort of attraction to get to be involved in that and, and, and to be at the forefront of those computing developments was a very exciting time and, and, and sort of set my, uh, my trajectory for the rest of my career. Well, the way you've talked about it, it seems uh, from your perspective to be something quite organic, quite natural. But is there any advice you would give your younger self if you would possibly be able to time travel? I don't think I got anything fundamentally wrong in that sense. I have no particular regrets about uh, the choices I made in terms of university degree. I think a degree in maths is a great foundation for pretty much any area of activity in science, technology, and so on. My policy when I wasn't quite sure uh, what I was going to do next was to keep as many doors open as possible. And I think that's the advice I tend to give my students today is if, it, if they're not sure what they want to do, uh, then make choices that keep as many doors open as possible and keep as many opportunities on the table. Because things turn up. The start of the home computer industry was completely unpredictable, at least the scale at which computers took off then. But because I, of the things I'd done before, I was well positioned to, to be involved in that. Yeah, so keeping, keeping doors open is, is, unless you really know exactly what you want to do and, and you're off on a vocational training direction, uh, that's also fine. But if most people aren't sure at that age what they're going to do and they certainly can't see their whole careers ahead of them. You know, taking yeah. courses that, that provide a broad base and keep lots of opportunities open is my advice. Well, I mean, you are at the moment in your in the in the business of training, if you like, the next generation of, of researchers and scientists. Um, what what sort of things? I mean, you've told me what sort of advice you give them on a personal level, but what sort of things would you like them to be working at, or what sort of would you think is the is the next big problem for humanity to start solving? Oh, I think uh, that humanity is not short of problems that need solving. Um, so there are many different and varied opportunities. Um, the students I deal with have all chosen to take a computing direction and computers are extremely important for solving societal problems you know, right across the board. You can see uses for computers in improving energy efficiency, um, in, in, in uh, controlling almost any system where you want to optimise how it operates. Um, and of course, even right across through to medicine, where uh, medical instruments are increasingly computer controlled. So there's a very broad range of potential careers opening up to people with computer science skills. But the same is actually true of, of most of the science subjects. I, I'm less well placed to advise people who are of more of an arts tendency than I am for the scientists and, and engineers. Is there yeah. any room for that sort of, uh, if you like, creativity or call it what you will, you know, sort of uh, differently way of thinking and maybe the, the science and the arts disciplines that are applicable in computing or, or science and research? 
Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, I, in fact, one of the things I regularly get a bit upset about is the fact that when the government talks about the creative industries, it doesn't include engineering, which I consider to be the ultimate creative in industry, because not only do you have to create new things, they also have to function. Uh, so I see engineering as a hugely creative career path. You know, we talk about innovation a lot in when we talk about the world of computing or the world of high tech, which I'm in a lot. Do you what do you see as perhaps being a most innovative breakthrough? Because a lot of what people claim is innovation is simply doing old things a bit faster. Do you think of innovation as something truly unique, a complete rethinking of, of a, you know, I mean, I'm thinking maybe the internet is blockchain innovative is, you know, uh, yeah. do you see anything like that in recent years or in our future? Yes, I, I mean, in, innovation in that sense of, of coming up with a new concept is an accelerating process. I mean, I, th I think there's more innovation in the world now than there ever has been. This applies in computing as everywhere else. I mean, yes, a lot of what you see industry doing is making incremental improvements to improve their market position. But you only have to look at a company such as Apple, who, who've innovated whole product classes that have transformed the market in much more fundamental ways than the sort of incremental improvement that characterise some of their competitors. Now, there's market innovation, but there's actually innovation embedded right inside these systems as well. Most people are unaware of this, but in the early 80s, there was a, a huge debate within computing about the merits of complexity in the design of processors and a movement which started in the west coast of, of the USA called the Reduced Instruction Set Computer was actually a movement that was all about throwing away some of the irrelevant complexity that had grown around the design of processors and coming up with much simpler and more elegant ways to do this. And if I characterize my career, I like to think I've generally contributed to computing by making things simpler, even though this is relatively hard to see from outside. The, the ARM processor that we developed at Acorn had RISC as its middle name. It was the Acorn RISC machine when it was first designed in 83 to 85. And that was picking up on this movement and really using simplicity and elegance to get better efficiency and performance out of the, you know, the engine, which is the heart of all computing devices. How do you view the relationship between the sort of cutting edge research, computing and science that you're doing and the market and commercialization and, and the, the sort of drive towards consumer or saleable projects? Well, I've been involved in, in both sides of this, and it's clear that, that fundamental research, if you like, um, on, on, on the research coalface is very explorative and experimental. And some of it translates into successful products downstream, uh, and, but quite a lot of it doesn't. But actually, that's what you'd expect with research, that, that, that it produces a wide range of results, a few of which have value and most of which don't. I mean, the, the same is true when you get to the commercial end. If you look at uh, startups, and I've been involved in, in, I don't know, 10 or so startup companies at various stages. And, you know, one in 10 of those goes on to be a big success and nine out of 10 generally fail before they've got anywhere. So the idea of finding a successful formula through through exploration is quite fundamental to research and to early stage commerce. I think they're, they're closely linked. Most, uh, most startup companies are generally fed off some aspect of academic research that, that looks commercially promising. Ultimately, of course, those early stage companies end up influencing or even being absorbed into the larger companies who can then scale up the success of, of those ideas that emerge. But I, d I don't see these as, as completely separate processes, but uh, they are processes at opposite ends of the scale and with very different uh, financial resource requirements. And so that brings me around to what I think is probably a wrap up question that I ask everyone on this podcast is what do you do for fun? What do you do to relax? You said you're approaching retirement. What's the uh, what's the plan? What I don't have detailed plans for my retirement at this stage. I will still continue to have involvement in, in various um, startup companies that I advise or uh, I'm a non-exec director of. Uh, so that will continue. Whether I resume my interest in model aircraft, which I had as a teenager and young man, um, remains to be seen. I have 
three grandchildren that will doubtless keep me occupied some of the time. And who knows? All options still on the table. Yes, yes. It's it's a very open question at the moment. It's still uh, most of a year away. So, Well, good luck with that. Thank you very much for talking to us today. I'm sure our audience has found lots of interesting things to chew over. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Human Brain Project podcast. If so, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating, and most importantly, share with a friend. To learn more about the Human Brain Project, please visit humanbrainproject.eu and be sure to check out other episodes in this series, packed with fascinating insight into how our minds work. Thanks for listening.